So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce this evening uh, our speaker, John Lawson. Uh, and John is no stranger to theater. Um, my understanding is that uh, a couple of years ago, after having served for 35 years on Broadway, he decided to retire. Uh, little did he know that he was going to be uh, in the theater again this evening, but uh, <laughs> here he is. Uh, no, John was uh, supervising the lighting and effects for a lot of shows, uh, a backstage uh, situation, but a very important one to anybody in the theater. Uh, he finished his career working for the Schubert organization uh, as the lighting and electric supervisor at the court and Schoenfeld uh, theaters. Uh, no small responsibility there. Um, he actually moved to Rhinebeck uh, during that time about 20 years ago. And what did he find fascinating here? It was the local history. And not that he didn't have a little bit of that himself. His father's family came from the Shokan uh, Hurley area. So moving to the Hudson Valley was actually, in a sense, uh, moving back home. So he is thrilled to be part of this effort to save what is known as the point. Uh, he's actually chairman of the Calvert Faux Preservation Alliance. It's a nonprofit organization working to restore and repurpose um, the point. And the point, uh, because of its position, so-called from its position on the Hudson River, uh, is the former Hoyt family uh, country estate. And it's uh, just, uh, it's in the northern part of the town of Hyde Park, uh, almost up here in Rhinebeck. So we sort of has latched onto it, at least for this evening. And uh, it's just south of the Mills Mansion, uh, Statsburg State Historic Site. So John, we are delighted to have you with us and uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank everybody for tuning in. I'm sorry this couldn't be live, but uh, we know what's going on with that these days, sadly. Anyway, welcome. Um, yeah, you may wonder what somebody who had a career in the theater has to do with any kind of historic preservation or Hudson River history. Uh, as Michael said, my father was from Shokan. In fact, his boyhood stone house is still there. And my grandfather's farm is under the Ashokan Reservoir uh, somewhere. So uh, as you can imagine, there was some little family bitterness there way back when. Anyway, oops, hold on, sorry about that. Okay, turn off that alarm. Um, so let me tell you briefly about Calvert Vox Preservation Alliance. Michael, I'm sorry to correct you, it is pronounced Vox. Uh, Vaux would be the French pronunciation. He was not French, he was British. Um, the, the Calvert Vox Preservation Alliance, or more quickly, the CVPA, is a 501c3 nonprofit group formed a few years back to celebrate and help preserve the works of Calvert Vox in the Hudson Valley region. Lately, our mission has become more laser focused on the point in Stottsburg to try to save it, restore it, and repurpose it. So let me tell you briefly the difference between the point and the Hoyt House. The Hoyt House is one building on the point. The point is the name of the land and the, and, sorry, the, uh, the parcel that the family uh, farmed and developed uh, because it was on a point jutting out into the Hudson River. The Hoyt House itself was the residence where they lived, but the point encompassed uh, numerous buildings uh, and the family always preferred calling it the point. Whenever I say Hoyt House to one of our, uh, one of the descendants who's still with us, he still gets a little miff. So we always say the point. Uh, the house and the, and the land had a long history in Stottsburg. There were three generations that lived there. The first generation started in 1852 or thereabouts. That was Leidig and Blanche Geraldine Livingston Hoyt. Yes, she was a Livingston. 
Her parents lived next door at Stutzberg House. That was before it was called the Mills Mansion, of course. And um, they had uh, Gerald Hoyt, that was the second generation, Gerald and Mary Hoyt, they were there at the point from about 1897 to 1927. And the third generation was Leidig Jr. and Helen Hoadley Hoyt, although there was a first wife, I'll get into that a little later. They were there from 1927 to 63 when New York State took it over. That was the fourth phase. Okay, I'm hitting my space bar and of course nothing's happening. Try it. There we go. There's a lovely color photograph of what we will call the Hoyt House at the point uh, designed by Calvert Vox. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the players who first built this place. All right, so you should be looking at a picture of Leidig, Munson, Hoyt. I hope that's the case. Somebody nod if that's true. Thank you, David. Uh, Leidig Hoyt was, he inherited wealth, although he was a businessman, but he was the son of Gould Hoyt, G-O-U-L-D. I've also seen it spelled G-O-O-L-D. Gould Hoyt was described as a, quote, merchant in the China trade, unquote. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means he was he, he traded with China or he sold dishes and plates. But in any case, that's the only description I've ever seen of him as a merchant in the China trade, obviously very successful, uh, married a woman named Sabina Schief and uh, Leidig was their son. Leidig lived from 1821 to 1868. Leidig's wife, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of her because David Byers and I looked far, far and wide for a picture of her and we were unsuccessful, right, David? Um, but we will, I'm sure at some point, dig one up. In any case, her name was Geraldine Livingston Hoyt. Her parents lived next door at Statsburg House. Her father was, I'm gonna try pronouncing it, Matarin Livingston, maybe it's Maturin. I, I would say Matarin probably and Margaret Lewis. Uh, the next player was of course, Calvert Vox. Now, Vox was British, but uh, at around 1850, Alec Andrew Jackson Downing went over to England to try to recruit some people to work with him in his successful firm. He was a well-known noted landscape architect. Many of you know the name, of course. Uh, he came over, he went over to England in 1850 and recruited Vox, who moved to America. Here's Downing. Oh, and I see my slides are getting a little off there. Uh, he looks like a character out of uh, Wuthering Heights or something there, I think. But uh, very noted designer. He brought uh, Vox over in 1850. Uh, unfortunately, Downing died two years later, I believe, in a steamboat accident out on the Hudson River somewhere I think down by New Paltz. I'm not entirely sure of that. But uh, in any case, their collaboration only lasted a couple of years. So Vox took over the business and started working on his own. Eventually he'd hook up with others, which I'll describe in a minute. Here was his business card, which I think is charming because one of Vox's, uh, uh, one of Vox's philosophies was that architecture and nature should be intertwined. And that's exactly what this business card uh, reflects. You look at the vines and the branches intertwining around all the buildings. And uh, it's, it's really a perfect indication of his philosophy. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting in the middle is the way the line's broken up. Two and a half percent for plans and specifications, which is a little odd for a business card, but who knows what the printing situation was in those days. So uh, Vox became very successful. He worked all over the East and the Northeast. He worked on the White House grounds. He worked on the US Capitol, the Smithsonian, uh, the Metropolitan Museum in New York. If you go there today, you can still see the uh, original building kind of tucked inside the existing building. Uh, he worked on uh, the American Museum of Natural History, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, Central Park, of course, was maybe his most famous commission. He would, did that with Olmsted, the Buffalo Park system. 
here are some of his design tools. I just included this because I thought it was kind of a fun photo. I guess at the top, that looks like a drafting pencil. In the middle, there's a compass. And the bottom, I don't know what that is. Some kind of, I, I don't know, paint spreading device, or maybe it's a paddle for bad children. I'm not sure. But his initials are there uh, on the bottom. You can see CV, Calvert Box. CVPA, my organization, has stolen those to some extent in our, oh, so now it isn't working again. In our stationery, you can see up there on the left, we've changed it a little bit, but uh, that gives you the idea of, of uh, how we've used his logo to this day. Vox partnered with a man named Frederick Clark Withers. Withers was also a, a well-known uh, designer. They, they partnered and formed an office in Newburgh, uh, did uh, work together on, on many sites, among them Olana, uh, the, here's one you all probably know. This is a, a drawing by Box and Withers of the Hudson River State Hospital. That was the color drawing. Sorry, it's in black and white. There's the building as it actually existed. Uh, of course, as most of you know, it no longer looks like this today after two fires. Uh, and God knows what's going to happen to it next because that place is crawling with excavators and uh, boring shopping mall buildings going up. Anyway, back to the point, let's talk a little bit about the history of how it got started. Originally, Leidig Hoyt bought the 62 acre Russell Farm. The Russell Farm had been started around the 1790s in Statsburg. It extended both uh, on both sides of the old Albany Post Road or Route 9, which at the time went right through Stan Statsburg, of course. Uh, that was moved in the 1930s, much to the delight of the people of Stottsburg, I'm sure. But in addition to the 62-acre farm, uh, Blanche Livingston Hoyt's mother gave them 30 acres from Stottsburg House. So I'm sorry, this map's a little hard to see, but uh, th this is essentially the shape of the parcel. It's kind of like a hatchet resting on its back. Way to the right would be the entrance uh, over the railroad tracks. The railroad was built around 1848. So there was a uh, bridge over the tracks and then the winding road. You can see some of the farm garden indication dead center. You can sort of see the house in the middle left there where all the, the lines are pointing. Uh, th those lines represent the view cuts that Vox laid out, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, uh, in a few minutes. Here's a little clearer, kind of fanciful layout of the way it looked. There's the house in the lower left middle. You can see how much of the site was open fields and meadows, farm fields. That, of course, is all gone today. But um, the site was built, the, the main house and the farm cottage, which is another building that Box Design was built around 1855. Here was a statement Vox made. I'm gonna read it to you. In country houses, the design has to be adapted to the location and not the location to the design. It is moreover undesirable and generally impracticable to make the natural subservient to the artificial. Woods, fields, mountains, and rivers will be more important than the houses that are built among them. And every attempt to force individual buildings into prominent notice is an evidence either of a vulgar desire for notoriety at any sacrifice or of an ill-educated eye and taste. So obviously he felt quite strongly about, uh, about the, the, the design process there. So here was the Hoyt residence. I believe this is an early photo because uh, he did indeed uh, uh, connect it to nature very thoroughly. There were big shade trees around it. There were shrubs planted. The porches in the front uh, had all kinds of vines and plants on them. So this may have been a very early shot, but uh, it shows you those front porches, which remind me a little bit of the Wilderstein porch. Um, you can see the canopies over the windows, which I believe were made out of metal. You can see the decorative verge boards on the roof, the decorative chimneys. But here gives a little better indication of 
how it fit into the natural surroundings. All the shade trees, this is the south lawn that would have been the main entrance to the house. It's still there today, although not in that pristine condition, obviously. Um, but it does show, uh, you know, I love this shot because you see the curtains up on the second floor there in the bedrooms, which is a good indication of people living there. So there was a thoroughly, there were a thorough set of drawings done by Box and Withers. I'm gonna show you a few of them, um, tell you briefly about the mystery of the missing drawings. These drawings were uh, given to the family who kept them for years. They ended up with Janet Graham, one of the descendants. I'll talk a little bit more about her later. She was grandson Leidig's niece. But she had the full set of plans. Uh, in 1989, they were loaned to the Museum of the City of New York. That's the last we've ever heard of where they were. Supposedly, they were given to the Avery Library at Columbia. I actually personally went there, and there's no trace of them. So uh, the drawings are missing, but we at least have this, this, uh, this, these renderings of them electronically. This is the main elevation on the south. You can see that porch on the left, or the canopy on the left was over the west porch. Box designed that so there were no columns because he did not want to block the views that he carefully laid out. I'll talk a little bit more, a little bit more about that in a minute. Again, it shows the decorative chimneys, the decorative slate roof. There's another better picture of that coming up. Here's the east elevation, that is the when you're approaching from what is now the Blue Trail today. Another one. If you look very closely in the bottom right, you can see Box and Withers, Newburgh, New York. So it was indeed, uh, the drawings were done by both Box and Withers. This is the north elevation. You can see the, uh, the, the central section of windows is the dining room. And originally, as you can kind of tell from the drawing, it was a bay window. Uh, that disappeared later on, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, but it was indeed originally a bay window. Here's some structural drawings, again, Vox and Withers. I would give anything to find those original large scale color drawings. And Wint Aldrich has helped me a little bit in the past trying to find them, but so far we've been unsuccessful. It is indeed a big mystery. Here's one of the ground plans. This is the second floor. Again, I'm sorry if you can't really see it too clearly, but um, five bedrooms and then in the upper right nursery, uh, the main staircase and hall is in the middle. Off to the sides of the drawing, you can see his detailed drawings of doorways and windows, uh, just, just beautifully laid out, uh, obviously all hand drawn because there was no uh, no computer, no CAD in those days. Here's the top floor of the servants' bedrooms. Interesting that it says servants' bedrooms, and then up to the top to the left, it says spare bedroom. So I can't imagine that guests would have gone up to stay on the servants' level, but maybe they did. Maybe things were different back then. And here's a design, a drawing he did of the actual roof layout. Even though nobody would ever be able to see this roof, they did a very careful and beautiful slate design of it. The, uh, the house was featured in Vox's book, Villas and Cottages, very famous book. Uh, he did, in, I think around 1857. Here is the page featuring the house, uh, design number 31. In other editions, it's mentioned as design number 26. But this is my uh, original copy. It shows it as Design 31, a long essay he wrote to uh, describe the place and his, his philosophy of building it. The only two buildings that Vox actually designed at the point were this house and what was called the Farm Cottage. Here's the Farm Cottage. You can see a uh, screened-in porch there. Looks small, but it's actually bigger than you think. It looks small from this angle. There's our screen porch on the right. Uh, this was a cottage that was for staff housing. 
Uh, it was just to the, uh, I would say, the northeast of the main house. There is a kind of a ghostly shot, uh, but notice that the screen porch is suddenly not screened anymore. So they must have been removable for, for uh, certain seasons, I suppose. And that couple, like the, the woman in white there, is uh, probably a couple of the staff who came out to pose for a picture. But it shows you the decent size of this building. The main house, the Hoyt house, cost $13,200. This cottage cost $1,800. Those were the days. Now, the view cuts, very important to the siting of the house. Uh, you can see these kind of pencil-like shapes jutting to the left and down to the uh, lower left. These were the five view cuts that Vox and Mr. Hoyt laid out. They did not clear cut the view to the west to see the river and the Catskills. They laid out these kind of pencil views. They were approximately 40 feet wide and uh, you, you could see them from not only the outdoor porches and verandas, but also from inside um, both first and second floors. Very important to the siting of the house. That view to the north straight up looked right at the Catskills. The three to the left, looked at the river and then the one down left also looked the river to the south. Here would be an example of the one to the south. This was obviously a later shot, but uh, kind of gave the idea of what Box was trying to do, not having a sweeping open view, but just little view corridors. Here's another example. This is again, probably a little more modern shot of the ship going by. Interestingly, I was up at the site the other day and I was looking this very direction and a ship that looked somewhat like that went by, which totally blew my mind because <laughs> this was a modern version of this photo just being relived. It was terrific. This is a view cut to the north that CVPA has uh, uh, collaborated with New York State to get recut with the Department of Environmental Conservation. We intend to recut the other four views as time and money allows. But uh, if you go up there and go around the chain link fence to the west, you can see this view, it's, it's quite beautiful. So let's look around the property a little bit. These are, unfortunately, I don't have any original shots of the entrance pillars, but this is the entrance pillars today. So ignore the uh, paper signs and the cardboard and the wood sticks sitting the ground and imagine it beautifully landscaped with beautiful shade trees on each side. The pillars are still in relatively good shape. It looks more or less what it looked like way back when. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the light spot in the distance, that kind of lime green circle is where the bridge over the railroad tracks is. Now, this bridge was, that's the current bridge. It was built in 1911. There was an earlier bridge. I've never been able to find any images of it. But there must have been because the railroad was built in 1848 and the point was built in 1855. So there was a railroad there and there was an earlier bridge. Somewhere there is probably an image. If anybody in the audience has one, boy, would I love to see it. Another shot of today's bridge with Stotsburg in the background. And here's a current shot of the decking on the bridge. I'll tell you a little more about CVPA's plans for that a little later on. Continuing our look around the property in 1858, Blanche's mother gave Lighting and Blanche a 99 year lease on the dock and the boathouse. Now, I don't know why a family would need to give another family member a lease on a boat dock, except that maybe in those days, the boathouse had a, a greater importance than boathouses do today. I mean, today you just pedal your kayak in there and go open a beer maybe. But in those days, the river was an important uh, route for materials, supplies, maybe even food. Yes, the railroad was there, but in, up until then, the, the boathouse and the dock were very key transportation elements. So I guess they had to do a kind of a, a legal family agreement. So mom gave them the 99 year lease on this dock. The site was uh, a farm. It was a, I guess you could call it a gentleman's farm. Leidig Hoyt was very much into farming. 
Uh, he, in the census back then, he actually listed himself as a farmer in Stottsburg. He didn't say he was a New York businessman. Here's a shot looking east from the front of the house over the farm fields. And the farm included uh, grains, apples, hay, along with cows, pigs, and poultry. So it was a, you know, a serious farming effort, like so many of the river estates. They had their farming arm, and uh, the point was no different. Here's a shot of the uh, part of the, uh, the kitchen garden. There's our farm cottage up to the left. This would be more or less along the Blue Trail today if you were walking toward the Mills Mansion. Of course, the, uh, the uh, farm cottage is gone, naturally. And here's another idea of the openness of the site. This was a, a garden to the south of the main entrance. You can see a little statue there in the middle. There it is a little more closely. There was a brick wall. If you go back there today, there was a lot of those bricks are still scattered all over in the woods there made by one of the famous Hudson, Hudson River brickyards, which were numerous, of course, back then. This uh, just included a couple of these shots. I have no idea who these people are, but this is uh, indeed on the property. Uh, that sure looks like a nanny with her fashionable hat. And the two children, maybe the same ones in that previous photo sitting on the lawn by the river having a merry old time. So Leidig died in 1868. This is his tomb in uh, St. James Churchyards down in Hyde Park. You can walk right up to it. Usually these tombs are, I think, big enough for an, a number of family members, but this one just says Leidig M. Hoyt. So it may be just him in there. I didn't inquire at the church. I'm sure they could tell us. Uh, I guess if there were other families, it would probably say Hoyt. Uh, but he died in 1868. Blanche died in 1897. Mr. Vox himself died in 1895. He's buried over in Kingston in the, I think it's pronounced Montrepos Cemetery. So then the next generation came along, Gerald and Mary Hoyt, and they kind of supervised the place from 1897 to around 1927. Here's a picture of them sitting, I believe, on the west deck. They continued the farming, but there were big, big changes during their tenure. First of all, in 1899, all the old barns that were left over from the Russell farm burned. It was a lightning strike and apparently all the wood barns burned together. And what was amusing to me, there was an artic old article I found that reported that the Statsburg Fire Company did good work. And I thought, no, so the barns burned to the ground I wonder how you define good work in a, a fire company. Maybe they prevented it from <laughs> moving on to other buildings and other places, but I thought that was an amusing quote. That same year, around 1899, the work started on the new brick barns, which were a, a huge addition to the site. This was one of the first ones to be built, the cow barn, still there today. Uh, Interesting building in that, I mentioned this in a previous talk, it's symmetrical except for the big doors in the center that are kind of off to the left a little bit. The, the people doors on the left and right are symmetrical and the second floor loading doors are symmetrical, but that door down below, which is uh, pocket doors, by the way, is off a little bit. I was in that building several years ago and there are there is a lower level to the right where there must have been, uh, I don't know, certain animals. So perhaps that explains why the door was off kilter. Anyway, that same year, the, the work continued on these brick barns. Here is the carriage house. This is obviously a later shot. You can see that truck. It's probably from the 50s, something like that. Here's a, maybe an earlier shot when it was indeed a carriage house, the stable boys holding onto those beautiful horses back when there were still horse and carriages going through the roads around the country estate before automobiles. There's one of the carriages and those diamond pane windows, which are still there today. Miraculously, they haven't been smashed by vandals. Uh, they're, they're still uh, looking just like that. Uh, another little fun quote I found, these, these brick buildings were completed in 1903 and there was a report 
I guess maybe from a building inspector that said, the tile work in the carriage house was condemned. Mr. Davy of Rhinecliffe laid new tiles satisfactorily. I thought that was kind of fun because I don't know how, how or why you condemn tile work, but maybe when there are animals involved, it has to be done a certain way. Uh, the, another building uh, in this brick, uh, the, all these brick structures was the mechanics garage. I'm sorry, I only have a modern picture of that. I could never find an old original picture. That was to service the automobiles that came along to the point. Uh, they would drive right in there and there was actually a mechanics pit underneath where the mechanic could crawl down much like they have today. That I assume is still there, I've never been in, so I don't know. In 1910, greenhouses were built. So obviously uh, that generation of Hoyts was still interested in growing things. These rather spectacular greenhouses were constructed to the east of the, the Hoyt residence. You can see our cow barn in the background. Note in the middle, there's a chimney that was a heating plant for the greenhouses. So it may have been a year round operation very possibly, or at least into the cold season. Uh, that chimney is important for a slide I'll show you later on, so take note. Here's another angle. There's our chimney off to the right, the heating plant. You can see these greenhouses were quite extensive. Not a trace of them remains. Um, look at the little decoration over the door there. It looks like kind of a coat hanger there. Then finally, the last of the major structures built at the point in 1911 was the Five Bay Garage. Still there today, of course. There are some old cars. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to date them, but they certainly go way back. One thing I've never figured out from this photo is how the doors opened. Because if you look at the doors on the, the two on the right and one on the left, it doesn't look like they opened to the left or the right, or they folded, or they were pocket doors because there's nowhere for them to pocket. I guess they must have somehow opened upward, but I don't know. Here's a close up of some of the old cars. Beautiful, beautiful big headlights. I included this shot because it shows those same cars, but down to the right is that farm cottage we looked at earlier. You can see where it actually located. That's the roof of it, you can see. I'm sure if you dug around down there, you'd find all kinds of remains of it. Here's a lovely shot of the carriage house on the left and the five bay garage on the right. Still looks more or less like that today, thankfully. And one more shot of the five bay garage with a modern car. I don't, I don't know what date that car would be. Again, that could even be early 60s, I suppose. All of these structures were designed by Robert Huntington, who lived down the road at Hopeland. I'll show you that in a moment. Huntington was a, uh, a uh, an architect who uh, lived, worked for a firm called Hoppet and Cohen in New York. He was also kind of a star tennis player, but he designed all of these brick structures. I think it's important to note that the Hoyt House did not, here I go again, the point, <laughs> what did not exist all by itself uh, in the area. There were neighboring estates, some of them quite impressive. Just to the south was the Lee Mansion. That is about a five or 10 minute walk from the, the point to the south. Um, it was also built by a Livingston descendant. Here's another shot of it. Again, you can see it's today it's all woods, but the, all the lawns and the fields were cleared at that time. And this is what's left. This is the water tower and cistern. It's still there today, as many of you who've hiked the Blue Trail know. It was right above the, the site of the Lee Mansion. You can still root around down there and find the outline of the old foundation. Here's another, of course, neighboring, uh, neighboring estate. This is the, at this point, would have been called the Mills Mansion, Stotsburg House in days past. Another neighbor was the incredible Locust down the road in Stotsburg. This is one of my favorite buildings of I wish it still existed, but what an amazing structure with all the towers and gingerbread and uh, fancy moldings, what have you. 
Uh, this was right down, just down the road in Stottsburg. There's a, another building there today, as most of you know, that was built in the 40s. Here's a wonderful aerial shot. I thank David Byers for giving me this one of the locus. Uh, Stottsburg House and the point would have been off to the right in this photo. But in the upper, upper area of the photo, you can see the Dinsmore Golf Course, which I'm told was one of the earliest private golf courses in the country. So they had uh, quite a life, these people. And also, of course, a little farther down the road was Hopeland House. This was Mr. Huntington's residence. I have read in two places that Calvert Vaux designed this building. I don't believe it um, for a couple of reasons. One is that Mr. Huntington was himself an architect, as I said. Secondly, uh, it just doesn't look if you will, Vox-ish to me, although I suppose he could have designed whatever a client wanted, but I believe Mr. Huntington himself designed that. Of all these estates, only the Hoyt residence and the mills are left. Oh, oh, before I go on, this was the inside of Hopeland. I, I wanted to show you this because it shows how almost baronial it was compared to the interiors of the Hoyt residence, which I'll show you in a couple of minutes. This would have been the living room. Look at the fireplace on the right. Look at the tapestry up on the wall on the left and those tiger rugs in the lower left. I mean, this is really a little Downton Abbey happening here. Here's the dining room again, this enormous fireplace and this huge painting off to the right. So this is really a, quite a place. So, um, Again, the, the Hoyt residence and mills are all that's left of all of these buildings. Here is the Lee Mansion burning down in the early 50s. At the time, it was a dormitory for the Anderson School. Uh, I have read reports that this was a suspicious fire, but I don't know whether that's true or not. Here is the, uh, the locust getting demolished. Very sad sight but this was so that a newer building, the one that's currently there could be built, I believe in the 1940s. Now let's get into the, uh, the Hoyt residence itself. In 1905, there was a major event in the history of the building. The entire first floor was redesigned by our friend, Mr. Huntington, again, who lived down at Hopeland. I have never been able to find images of the first floor before this redesign. I'm sure they're out there somewhere. Again, if anybody watching can help with that, hallelujah. This is a picture of the dining room. Uh, after the Huntington design, you can see this kind of neoclassical plaster work, uh, the broken pediments over the doors, that sort of thing. Here's another shot of the dining room, but compare it to those shots of Hopeland I just showed you, and you can see it really has a much less ostentatious feel. I mean, certainly, a certain amount of formality, but nowhere near as over the top baronial as the as Hopeland was. There's Mr. Huntington himself, the designer who redid that first floor. Quite a dashing young man. Here's a shot of what they called the red room. It was also the billiard room in the Hoyt residence. This would have been on the northwest corner. Um, all of these fireplace mantles are gone, of course. But uh, as you can see, it looked like just kind of a, I wouldn't say average living room, but a, a very nice, uh, a comfortable living room with a little fire burning in the fireplace there. Here's the foyer. Again, simple. You'll notice that there are mirrors everywhere. And I, I should have pointed that out on the last slide. All the fireplaces had big mirrors over them. Here's a mirror on the left. Uh, rather rather large scale mirror. I suspect this was maybe to make the house feel a little bigger. I don't know, um, but they were in every room and over every fireplace. This is a little hard to see, I apologize. This was the study on the Southeast corner of the residence. You can see lined with bookcases on the upper left photo. Again, the mirror over the fireplace. And another shot, the southeast corner down to the right there. This was the only room that Huntington did not redesign on the first floor. I guess Mr. Hoyt or the, the Hoyts at the time liked it just the way it was. Here's a modern shot, thanks to Peter Esterson. This is looking east from the 
what was that red room I showed you to the side entrance. But again, it shows you the plaster work that was done. Looks pretty much like that today. This is upstairs. The upstairs were very simple. These are the entrances to the bedroom with Vox's signature canted doorways. There's the little corners chopped off. Uh, not much decor, a really very simple architecture, kind of refreshing, uh, I think. Again, I'm sorry, we don't have any original shots of that. This is shots from today, but I wanted to show you at least what it, uh, what it looked like. Here's a typical bedroom. Oh, and lo and behold, there's a fireplace that wasn't stolen or sold or vandalized. But again, just simple, look over the windows, very simple, basic uh, bits of decor, nothing too fancy or ostentatious, just the exact opposite of Hopeland. Here's a third floor shot. This was part of the servants' quarters. Talk about basic, there you go. I always think when I go up there, and we've been in there many times the last couple of years, that it must have been bloody hot up there in the summer, obviously pre-air conditioning. So then the third generation comes in. This is Leidig Hoyt, the grandson of Leidig Munson Hoyt, who built the place. Uh, this, this is a, him at Yale on the football team, handsome looking man. There he is looking, at, that, kind of, that kind of looks like a mug shot, but he's uh, uh, obviously with a portrait of as a young man. Here he is as an older man in his study, that, that room I showed you that was not changed by Huntington. He's obviously posing for this shot on the first rung of the ladder, looking for a book. And uh, the caption says he uses a ladder and a portable light to help find books. Here was uh, Leidig's first wife, Julia Wainwright Robbins. They married in 1914, they divorced in 1924. If you read the text, uh, she was an actress. She made a silent film, which we actually have a recording of. And she plays in the film, I'm gonna read this to you. Kitty, the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Her brief scene shows her chugging from a liquor bottle. But the cast of the film is remarkable. If you read that, Paul Robeson, Sinclair Lewis, Anita Luce, Theodore Dreiser, Sherwood Anderson, Serge Kusevitsky, who went up to form Tanglewood, H.L. Mencken, Charlie Chaplin, Ethel Barrymore, and Somerset Maugham. Incredible uh, cast list. So uh, she, as an actress, she worked with some notables. But I've been told by Garrett Graham, who many of you may know, still lives, he's a Hoyt descendant who lives in Rhinebeck, that being an actress, she was somewhat outcast by the family because at the time acting was looked on as a lowly profession. Now, of course, famous actors are looked on as gods and goddesses in this country. Here's a shot, another shot of Leidig. Uh, that is Garrett on the right, Garrett Graham. Uh, he's been very helpful to me with uh, images and notes and books and opinions. He told me the name of the dog, I forget what it is. Uh, anyway, if you look in the up, kind of middle upper left, that would be what today is the Blue Trail heading south. It was the road to that Lee mansion originally that burned down, that I showed you a picture of. But that's Garrett at age, I don't know, what do you think? Three, maybe, something like that. And Garrett's around 70 today, so this would have been about 67 years ago. So you do the arithmetic. His second wife, Leidig's second wife, Helen Hoadley Hoyt, was the one who stayed in the Hoyt residence till the end. She was, according to uh, Garrett, quite a, a stern, opinionated woman, which one can sort of gather from that photo on the right. Oops, sorry, that's a little premature, I beg your pardon. Hold on one second. Okay. Okay, sorry, folks. Um, where were we? Yes, Helen Hoadley Hoyt. Yeah, sorry for the pause, everybody. Uh, around 1928, my problem is I'm missing a page in my screen. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, Helen Hoadley Hoyt. 
I want to read a quick quote from uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's column. She wrote a column for years and years called My Day. And of course, the Roosevelt's lived, lived down the road in Hyde Park. Here's a quote from her High Day, My Day column of January 6, 1940. Last night, we held the judicial reception. It was one of the smallest receptions of the year. It was good to see the Chief Justice in such good health and spirits. We sat around in the president's study and talked after the reception was over. We had three guests who are Hudson River neighbors staying in the house, Judge John Mack of Poughkeepsie and Mr. and Mrs. Leidig Hoyt of Statsburg. So obviously this generation still got around among the river people, including the Roosevelt's. Uh, so they were uh, certainly in the social world then. So during this generation, there were big changes. The farming was terminated around 1928 on the property. Why? I, I don't know. It could have been changing tastes. It could have been economics. But it, it was, it was uh, indeed stopped completely. 1928 was also the year that it was recommended that New York State acquire all of the lands from Stottsburg west of the railroad tracks north to the Mills Mansion. Who recommended this? Anybody recognize him? Our old friend, Robert Moses. Uh, this was 1928, as I said, that he recommended that all the land be taken by New York State. Since that didn't happen until 63, somehow the Hoyt family held out for 35 years, even over the power of Robert Moses. Pretty impressive. Then in the late 20s, there was a, uh, there was a movement to try to modernize, quote unquote, the house. Uh, the taste for 19th century romanticism was fading a little bit. So what they did was they removed the window hoods and the verandas, I guess, to kind of streamline the building. You can see where the porches were on each side of the portico. There are just awnings there. You can also see on the uh, second floor windows, those uh, the canopies are all gone. So the house is sort of simply, so it still is handsome, but it doesn't have those wonderful adornments that it had earlier. On the north side, oops, sorry, <laughs> one more shot. I think this shot is wonderful. Again, it's modern because uh, of the car, but it shows the uh, awnings that replaced some of the window canopies again. Uh, this, this looks to me like a house out on Long Island in the Hamptons somewhere. I don't know why I say that, but it just has that feeling to it. I wanted to show this picture because this is the ghost of the of a window canopy above the windows. You can see the curved line on the left. What's interesting here is that if you look on the right and the left, you see the squared off decorative stone, but under the canopy it was all rough stone. Obviously, this was a money saving move that they did because you would never see the stone over the windows. They were all covered by the canopies, and you can still see that very easily today. Here is a shot of the north side when they added a garage in the basement. You see in the lower left of the house, that actually became a garage. You see the driveway was extended around the building and curved right into the, what had been mostly kitchen quarters. The kitchen was in the basement. This is also a good shot of those uh, Huntington redesigned dining room windows. You remember I told you earlier, originally they were bay windows. They have no pictures of the bay windows, but here's a good shot of those dining room windows. Remember that because there's a shot coming up that will uh, look very different. The greenhouses were removed. Uh, I don't know what year, but this, uh, this uh, generation of the family removed them. Um, this was what was left, and the, the reason they left it was to act as a, a plant house, a little tiny mini greenhouse, uh, to a potting shed, I should say. But that was that chimney you remember from earlier, you saw between the greenhouses. There's not a trace of the greenhouses, all planted over with grass and lawns. In 1938, the Mills Mansion, by then was called the Mills, it wasn't called it, but we know it as the Mills Mansion, became a property of New York State Parks. And the reason I mention that is because it means that the Hoyt property, the point, 
was now sandwiched between Mills Norrie Park on the south and Mills on the north. So uh, I think the, the doomsday was looming once this was done. It's just a question of how long they could hold out. In 1944, during the war, the entire west side of the Hoyt property along the river was lumbered for the war effort. So all those pencil views uh, that, that uh, Vox and Mr. Hoyt laid out were completely destroyed. Again, we are trying to restore them. Uh, but some of the logging included historic trees. There was a note in the Poughkeepsie Journal that said one tree was 58 inches in diameter. In diameter, not circumference, but diameter. That's a huge tree. This kind of gives you an idea to the left there of what it was like after that lumbering was done. You see all the views were more open, still beautiful certainly, but the whole concept of, uh, of uh, Vox's pencil views was gone. There's another, another shot of it, kind of wide open vistas. In 1957, the dock was, the dock and the boathouse were quit claim to New York State. The boathouse was removed. 57 was indeed 99 years after Blanche Livingston's mother gave them the right to use the boathouse. So that was the end of that. In 1959, uh, Leidig died. At the time, he was the deputy police commissioner of New York City. Here's his grave, also down in St. James Churchyard. Interestingly enough, 1959 is the year that Leidig dies. That same year, Helen Hoadley Hoyt builds a swimming pool. And you kind of have to wonder, was this done in a therapeutic way of her losing her husband or was she kicking up her heels? And <laughs> I shouldn't say that, that's disrespectful. But uh, it's very odd that she built the swimming pool the same year her husband died. There's our cow barn in the background. Here's the pool looking north. That's that main entrance drive in the background from Statsburg up to the Hoyt residence. And at the same time, she changed our little potting shed into what she called our cocktail terrace. There it is again, but now it was a cocktail terrace. So I guess they'd go down there and have cocktails and take a swim. And interestingly, the pool was quite far from the house. It was a, it was a hefty walk uh, downhill to the pool and then uphill back to the house. So at this point, there were 16 buildings that originally had been on uh, part of the Russell farm or part of the point, they were all gone. The only ones that were left were the brick barns, the Hoyt residence, uh, the farm cottage and this structure. 1963 arrived, that was a fateful year when New York State Office of Parks and Recreation bought the point from Helen Hoadley uh, Hoyt and the 92 acres, they bought it for $300,000. This was 35 years after Robert Moses first proposed to acquire the site. There's the paperwork. If you look closely, you can say $300,000. It was a reluctant sale. She didn't want to do it. I'm sure nobody else in the family wanted to do it. The pressure was too great. This was the parcel that New York State bought. You can see how it had been sandwiched in by the, um, at the north and at the south. It's a, had that hatchet shaped again, that, that little scribble up there is wrong. It was 63, not 1962. Uh, this also shows at the bottom of the hatchet, the old original Route 9, the uh, Albany Post Road, which of course, again, went through Statsburg Hamlet way back when. And then there's the modern Route 9 on the bottom, much to the relief of the residents of Statsburg. So Helen Hoadley Hoyt was offered a five-year residence to stay in the Hoyt residence after New York State bought it. But she left after six months. I think she was just too emotionally distraught, too disgusted. Here are her comments from a letter she wrote to Janet Graham. This was uh, Leidig's niece from his first wife. Here, quote, the stewardship of the point has given me real happiness an occupation which I loved and justified, the reason for staying here where I was most contented. And now that this beautiful place is being taken away from us, we must try to find a replacement. Alas, there is no appeasement for the loss of roots. Fundamentally, and the thing that upsets me the most is the knowledge that this tragedy to us is symptomatic 
of the loss of individual freedom for us Americans, which bores into my soul with discouragement and fear following in its wake. But we are in the welfare state and you and I and a few others are made to suffer. How many more freedoms are daily going by the boards and where is this all going to end? Quite a comment from Helen Holdley Hoyt. You could probably hear people making comments like that today. So the Hoyt family lived there for 107 years and she was the last one who was the steward of the site. Here's something I dug up in Garrett's papers. This was her paperwork, how she uh, kept track of all the expenses. And I think this is 1960 and 61. Uh, I won't bother going through the details, but this was a handwritten ledger of everything she spent money on. Here's another page. One thing that interested me here, right in the middle, says chainsaw, $385. I thought, good Lord, a $385 chainsaw in 1962? That must have been a heck of a, an implement because today you can get them for 125 bucks. But anyway, so the house was taken. Uh, New York State added it to the park. There was an auction of the furnishings by a man named O. Rundle Gilbert in 1963. He apparently was quite a noted auctioneer in the area, based out of Poughkeepsie, I believe. He was the same man who auctioned the Hopeland furnishings when the Hopeland descendants decided to demolish that home. Here's a notice of his auction sale, Hopeland, Statsburg on Hudson, New York. Now, New York initially planned to demolish the house. There's a headline, I believe this was the Poughkeepsie Journal. Helen's remark up there, to think this place was a beauty spot, it's a disgrace. Ooh, the emotions that were going through her, you can only imagine. The plan was to demolish the house and build a swimming pool, and I'm not making up this number, big enough for 2,400 swimmers, 2,400 swimmers on the site. There was gonna be a parking lot for 960 cars and 22 buses. This was the original plan. This never happened uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, I think they didn't have the money for it at the time. And also there was a rather pronounced uh, preservationist uh, uh, complaint uh, movement, uh, which really saved this structure from the wrecking ball. Um, the Farm Cottage, you may remember, that was uh, torn down by New York State, but this building was not. Over the years, obviously, after uh, the family moved out, there was vandalism and decay. I'm gonna show you a few kind of sad shots. How do you like that? A guy breaking in and writing peace on the wall with a peace sign. Here's an, a very, uh, very helpful up arrow on the staircase. Look at the modesty of the staircase though. This was, that was the main staircase up to the bedrooms. I mean, again, you compare that to Hopeland or what surely it was like in the, the locusts. Very modest, unostentatious. Here's a dining room with uh, the plaster crumbling, uh, the, those windows I pointed out earlier. Uh, they were the Huntington windows, not the bay windows. Uh, sadly, uh, there was a storm this past summer, a bad uh, windstorm, and uh, the windows, I'll show you in a minute, did not uh, do well. Here's a shot of the foyer again with the plaster crumbling. Doors boarded up, all the light fixtures removed. Here's the side or the east porch, completely gone today, uh, but you can see uh, the original beautiful decor that it had. Interesting to me, there are bars on the windows. I wonder if those were put on during the Hoyt family tenure or if the state put those on afterwards. I would imagine maybe the family put them on, which would have indicated, uh, oops, sorry, indicated uh, that there had been break-ins, obviously. Here's a rather forlorn shot taken, I imagine, from a drone. This is kind of heartbreaking because when you think what a magnificent estate it was at one time with those beautiful fields and barns and outbuildings and, and in fact shade trees and you look at those scrawny things to the left of the building, it just is such a <laughs> such a somber, forlorn 
area of the shot. However, over the years after the state took control, there were a number of reports, proposals, plans. Um, there was a 1969 New York State Historic Trust Report. There was a 1974 Historic Structures Report, which actually recommended that the residents be used as parks headquarters. That never came through. In 1979, the house was put on the National Register of Historic Places as a contributing structure in the 16 mile historic district on the east side of the Hudson. So it was a contributing structure. 1981, there was a Hudson River shorelands proposal for a 99 year lease. 1982, there was a request for proposals for both Mills and Hoyt. Uh, from what I've heard, there were no proposals <laughs> when this went out. There was a landscape study center idea uh, I don't know what year that was. I believe Joan Davidson was deeply involved in that. Um, there was a 1984 conference center concept which proposed restaurants, 600 hotel rooms. That didn't happen. There was a Jan Hurd Picorni adaptive reuse study, very thorough document, 1993. Uh, Jan Hurd Picorni was a very uh, respected New York City architect and planning firm. 1998, the seminal Dole and Dole uh, landscape plan, landscape restoration plan for the point. This is a huge volume. I have a copy. They analyze virtually every plant and every brick and every square inch of the site. Uh, again, nothing came of it. 2013, there was the actual New York State master plan. That's the most recent big plan that was done. Uh, it does call for renovation of the Hoyt residence, among other things. So all these plans and proposals, why did none of them pan out? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if it was a combination of economics, uh, bad luck, uh, lack of interest. But for one reason or other, all of these proposals uh, kind of hit, hit a dead end, hit a brick wall. So let's take a quick look and just compare the past with the present. Here's our original house, that beautiful color photo. There it is today. Yeah, it's uh, not inspiring, is it? We actually have cleared all that brush. So the building itself is more visible, which may or may not be a good thing. Um, here is a uh, the shot of those dining room windows and the, the uh, garage down below. Here is the shot today of those dining room windows, which were, as I said, blown out in the storm. Thankfully, the Taconic Regional Maintenance people came and salvaged all the molding and Cremona locks, Cremona hardware from these windows. So that's what's left. That's the way it looks today. Rather discouraging, to say the least. That piece of plywood was leaned up there to cover a hole into the basement. So here's our original shot with the porches and these beautiful shade trees. Look at them all. There's the front today. There are two shade trees left. They are both leaning precariously toward the house. We're not quite sure what to do about that. We'd hate to take them down because there's a certain amount of history there, but they are leaning right over the house. And if they fell on it, I think that could very possibly be the end. There's our little pool house again, our cocktail terrace. There it is today. It actually looks a little more sad than that right now. There's our cow barn in the upper right. There's our swimming pool again, looking south. That's what's left of it. You can still walk right up to it today. Uh, you probably don't wanna take a dip, but there it is. And finally, I included this, I don't know how did that happen? This is what's left of the kitchen, which was in the basement level, big old cast iron stove, still there. Uh, the kitchen's quite impressive. It was the really the whole uh, uh, floor plan of the house. There were servants' resting areas, wine cellars, storage rooms, pantries, enormous boiler uh, for heat and hot water. Uh, most of all that's still down there. So CBPA has achieved some things. Uh, 
in uh, 2014, we got a new roof in partnership with New York State government and the Environmental Protection Fund and Save America's Treasures. New slate roof put on the building. We ripped off a modern kitchen addition on the north side and did some repointing. All of this cost about a half a million dollars. Remarkable what things cost now. This was the roof uh, in process. We shored up the portico, which was in danger of collapse. We used a wonderful gentleman named Mike Pelletier, works for a company called the House Right LLC, did a beautiful job shoring it up. Obviously a temporary solution. This one I showed you earlier, this was the view cut we did with the DEC uh, uh, scenic vistas program. Doesn't look, it looks more impressive when the foliage is there because then you really get the, uh, the pencil view. We installed a historic marker right in front of the building. I'll show you a little more close up of that. Designed by Central Park architect Calvert Vaux in 1855, Lydic Hoyt and Geraldine Livingston Hoyt, cited for its fine views. One woman wrote to us on Facebook, you forgot Olmsted when you mentioned the park. No, we didn't forget Olmsted. This is about Calvert Vaux. It's not about Olmsted. Vaux was a, the lead designer in the uh, Central Park effort. He, uh, he enlisted Vox to work with him on it. We've installed some banners explaining to hikers going by uh, the history of the house and the potential for the future. David Byers very kindly designed these banners for us. There's a close up of one of them. Some of the images you've seen today. Then we get to our bridge, which I showed you earlier. We're now in the middle of a, a fundraising effort to reopen the bridge. It's been closed for several years, as I said, to hikers. We've received a Greenway grant to uh, do a study of what it would take to reopen the bridge. Again, that's, uh, that's the, the, the key element right there is the decking on the top. We're hoping that the steel is sound. We have an engineer working with us, Peter Maluski, who's gonna, with Amtrak's cooperation, is gonna do an underbridge inspection Hopefully it'll be just the decking that needs to be pulled up. And uh, again, the Greenway grant will help us pay for this inspection and report. And uh, we hope to maybe get it done by next calendar year and open it to hikers again. Again, the front entrance, um, it's on our next I Love My Park Day. We may try to get some masons involved to work on restoring the stonework. I don't know if you can see way to the right, you see it's starting to crumble a little bit. Here's a view looking out through those pillars to the south toward the Dinsmore Golf Course. This is probably, other than the overgrown uh, bushes and shrubs, it's probably what it looked like pretty much back in the days when the Hoyts lived there. Those were the entrance pillars and there was the golf course and there's the wooden fence across the road. We're also planning a spring symposium at Edgewater to. Uh, uh, for the public about Calvert Vox and his importance. So what are we thinking for the future? Well, a number of things. We have a few concepts. Uh, one would be uh, turn the main house into a center for the study and appreciation of Calvert Vox's work. Another one would be a, a study center for Hudson Valley architecture. And a third one, which a lot of people are excited about, is to open, turn the entire campus, including the brick barns into a preservation trade campus where young people, uh, veterans, disadvantaged people could go and learn preservation trades, masonry, plaster work, uh, carpentry, that sort of thing. We, we would envision the brick barns being used as workshops and the main residence being used as offices and classrooms. And in fact, the students could even work on the buildings themselves as kind of hands-on training. There are a lot of people who are very excited about that concept. So we hope to raise funds to do an official feasibility study for actually all of those concepts I just mentioned. Um, one thing I'd like to suggest for those of you who can, and I've said this at an earlier presentation, take a walk out to the site. It, it's easy to get in from the south route from the Mills Nori entrance, about a 15 minute walk along the Blue Trail. You'll see when you get there why this place really has to be saved. It's, 
it still has a magic to it. It has a, has a, a kind of a quiet nobility, even in its current state, the way it's cited, the architecture, the, uh, the scale of the place. I think you'll see what I mean when you go out there. Every time I get kind of uh, discouraged in, in my house, in my laptop, thinking how much money this is gonna take and how many people it's gonna involve and how many years, I close my laptop, I go out there and I actually get re-inspired because the place is so beautiful and so deserving of renovation that it, uh, it kind of pumps me back up, so. So after 60 years of plans and proposals, assessments, CVPA is, is forging on, we're not giving up. Um, we have a website and a, a year-end appeal, much of which will be devoted to getting this house someday back to something resembling this. Where again, we're trying to raise the Greenway matching funds uh, for the engineer's report. It's a major element of our year-end appeal. Uh, we are nailing out couple hundred uh, appeals. For those of you who are not on the mailing list, please check out our website, calvertbox.org. And uh, if you are able to make a donation, it would be much appreciated. We would love as a first step to get that bridge reopened. Uh, by the way, a, a future grant we're applying for CFA, it'll probably be 2023, will be to get the main residence open to the public. It's currently not open to the public because of asbestos, and lead, and all the usual suspects. Uh, what we would do is get those abated. We'd get uh, utilities retrofitted out there because now there's just minimal electricity and no plumbing. Uh, we'd get a, a roadway and a parking area established. This would be a CFA grant, uh, which would be, we would apply for about a half million dollars and have to raise about half million in matching funds. That's for 2023. Our immediate concern is uh, getting this bridge open and maybe continuing on the restoring the view cuts to the river because those are really uh, significant in showing what the, the magic of the place and what Vox and Hoyt intended. So there we are. That's the point in Stotsburg. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. I could try to answer them. I'd even I'd love to hear comments if anybody has any. Uh, Michael, I'll send it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, John. This is this has been a absolutely magnificent and comprehensive uh, review of a spectacular site, one that came so close to getting destroyed, eliminated, and uh, thank God you're interested in, in doing everything you can and have uh, pulled some people together to work with you and uh, best of luck in your fundraising efforts. Uh, let me open it at this point to questions. Um, if you, we have uh, about, no if you do have a question, uh, I did suggest earlier that folks submit those via chat, but I think we're a small enough group where you can unmute yourself and uh, let us hear your questions. I did uh, get one from uh, Barbara Sweet. She had a question regarding uh, slide number 37. Uh, Barbara, Barbara was asking whether the smoke, whether that was smoke coming out on the right. I didn't pay enough attention to 37 uh, by the time I saw that inquiry. So I'm not sure what Barbara was referring to. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, John. Well, 37 was a shot of the greenhouses. And of course it did have the heating plant that I put sure. in the middle in that chimney. Yeah. Which is, so there very well could have been smoke if that's what she's referring to. Uh, what would the fuel have been? Well, this was 1910. I would imagine coal or wood, probably. Right, right. Uh, there would have been a big enough staff to stoke a fire like that, I'm sure. Yeah. So, yeah, very well could have been. Yeah, I, I noticed that, uh, you know, what became the cocktail house, the, the potting shed, would have been the originally the stoke house for that 
particular greenhouse. Yes. Uh, every one of them would have had it. And the stoke house was the place where you uh, kept the fire going. And actually, one of the reasons that it was so difficult to maintain the violet industry was that people who had those violet houses, and we had hundreds of them here in the town of Rhinebeck, and especially in the village of Rhinebeck, uh, was that in a win winter night, uh, you needed to make sure that fire didn't go out or all your violets would be history uh, and the wrong kind of history. So, uh, yeah. yeah Other questions? Thank you. Remember, you, you need to unmute yourself if you're going to ask a question. Yes, Craig Marshall, go for it. Uh, John, that was really an excellent presentation. Could you just go over one more time how you get to see the property? Where's the entrance? Sure. There are two entrances to it, and hopefully when we restore the bridge, there'll be three. Uh, there, if you park at, as if you were going to the Mills Mansion, are you familiar with that parking area? Yes. Yeah. If you park there, you walk down the long driveway toward the river. The driveway curves around to the left, goes, it hugs the river, and then curves again to the right past the old uh, Mills superintendent's cottage, not really a cottage. And then you just go up the hill a little bit and you'll come to the brick barns. And then you go a little farther and you'll come to the main residence. It's, it's the blue trail in the trail system, in the Mills Nori trail system. So it's marked as the blue trail? The blue trail, right. Now, an easier way and a more level way is to, is to go into Mills Nori Park and you park just before the gates to the campsites. Uh, and then you get on the blue trail there as well and walk north. It's about 15 minutes, very level, very easy walk. And you'll come to the house. Thank you. Sure. OK. Thanks, Craig. Any other uh, questions that folks may have? Uh... OK. Well, I All think right. it's a great presentation. We want to thank John so much for uh, this great talk, and we hope that you are do well with your uh, fundraising and restore this place one of these days. Thank you. Thank you, John, so much. It's a, it's, it's going to be a long road ahead, but it's it's worth it's worth every bit of the effort. John, if there if there is anyone in our audience that uh, would like to support this work, uh, how is it that they would uh, make a donation to do uh, that? It, the website is calvertbox.org. And if you go onto the website, the, there are donate buttons on there. Thank you so much, John. And okay. thanks to all of you. Uh, and by the way, John had mentioned uh, the relationship to the brick building industry. And I'd like to remind everyone that on Jan I think it's January 21st is our next program. And it will be about the brick building industry. Um, so tying things all together and wishing all of you the very best uh, holiday. Uh, we'll see all of you, I hope, in January. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, everybody. Good Thank night. You. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you. Good night.